And joining us now on the debate in New York, New York, Colm Lynch, UN correspondent with the Washington Post and blogger at the Turtle Bay blog at Foreign Policy Magazine. In our nation's capital, Paul Heinbecker, former Canadian ambassador to the UN and author of Getting Back in the Game, a foreign policy playbook for Canada. And Jeffrey Simpson, national affairs columnist at the Globe and Mail. And joining us here in studio, Jonathan Kay, columnist at the National Post. And it's good to see you again, John, and all of our guests at uh, Points Beyond in New York and in Ottawa. I want to start by quoting Andrew Coyne, one of our fine journalists here in Canada. And you guys all know how much Andrew likes to talk, so it's a bit long. Get comfortable, and then we'll come out with this, some questions. The votes have been counted. The coveted Western Europe and others seat on the UN Security Council has been decided, and it's time to congratulate Portugal on its stunning victory. That, at any rate, is what you would gather from the Portuguese press. Ah, but this is Canada, where it's all about us. If Portugal were selected over Canada, it can't possibly be a reflection of Portugal's merits, but only Canada's defects. Plainly, the UN's 192 member states intended to send a message to the Harper government, being as obsessed with Canadian foreign policy debates as most Canadians aren't. Oddly, that was the one point on which the government and its critics were agreed. The government suggesting its, quote, principled stand on Iran, North Korea, and Arctic sovereignty, really, the Arctic, might have raised some hackles, the opposition blaming its positions on global warming, foreign aid, and the rights of indigenous peoples. The notion that these votes are decided on the basis of broad principles of foreign policy bears no resemblance to how the UN actually works. More typically, votes are swapped, one for another, with a frankness that would make a congressman blush. Guyana's vote, for example, was purchased, or not, it's a secret ballot, so you never know, in exchange for Canada's support for a Guyanese judge's bid for a seat on the International Criminal Court. So says Brother Coyne. All right, uh, Colm, you are there where the UN plants its flag, or shall I say its many flags. Uh, is it really as simple as all that? Well, it's true that there are, there's lots of sort of nefarious practices that are sort of underway to purchase seats and to trade um, different seats for, you know, ambassadorial posts, for seats on the Security Council and other important bodies. But, I mean, I think this, this is a, a fight that Canada should have won. Um, it was in a very strong position. It has a good history with the UN. It's always been considered a model UN citizen. Portugal was, would, I mean, po Portugal and Germany beat out Canada, and that sort of provides four EU countries on the Security Council. It doesn't take a lot of um, effort to try and convince a lot of the other membership that it's not good to have one powerful bloc so overrepresented in the Council. So it could be that, you know, there are certain things that Canada stood up for its principles, but it didn't do a very good job of making its case, and I think it had you know, a fairly decent case to make. Okay, I mean, hold off on the... Of representation. I'm going to ask everybody to hold off on the reasons why we lost. We're going to get to those. I just want to start by f trying to figure out better, is this really how the UN works? And Paul Heinbecker used to be there. So, uh, simply case of Portugal bartered better than we did, they played the game better than we did? No, I think part of it was a campaign, but I, you know, I think uh, part of it also was the policies. There are no, there's nobody probably on earth, no collection of people who are more aware of Canadian foreign policy than the permanent representatives in New York. Part of their day-to-day -day business is to know what each other is doing. So I think, you know, that that's an issue. I don't, by the way, find the, the idea of trading uh, votes particularly nefarious. Uh, I think that's sort of the way things work. If, uh, you know, when I was uh, amb uh, ambassador there, before I had left, we were already thinking about our next run, and people were approaching us saying, we'd like you to support us for the Security Council in, say, 2007. And we would respond, <coughs> well, we're going to be running in uh, 2010, uh, so, uh, you know, we'll support you if you support us. Now, you know, we didn't do that with Burma, I presume. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, well, there are a lot of countries that uh, you can trade votes for. There are 116 elected democracies uh, uh, in the UN. Jeffrey, if that's how it works, does that offend your sensibility of fair play or how things should happen? I think it's a mixture, Steve, of uh, sort of uh, wheeling and dealing and countries looking at the candidates' records. It's a mixture of both. Let's assume for the sake of argument that Andrew Coyne's views are correct and that Canada and Portugal and Germany were all wheeling and dealing and trading nominations for this or that. Presuming they all did it with equal intensity, that still wouldn't explain the outcome whereby we finished a bad third. So if you assume that we're all playing that element of the game and we're playing it with equal skill and equal energy, 
then there has to be some other factor that explains why we finished third. And you don't want to talk about those factors, but we will. So I don't think it was the wheeling and dealing. Okay, yes, you're right. Uh, as soon as I hear from John Kay on his take on this question, we'll get into the whys. Go ahead, John. Uh, I'm guessing that I have in mind the same factors that uh, Jeffrey was thinking about. Uh, look, there's 57 members of the Organization of the Islamic Conference. Uh, it's 57 votes at the United Nations. Uh, OIC tends to be, in many respects, a single-issue voting body at the United Nations. It's all about Israel. Canada has staked out a very strong position in support of Israel, and I should hasten to mention this isn't just under Stephen Harper. Paul Martin changed the voting policies for Canada at the UN uh, back in 2005. Uh, and so it's no secret why we wouldn't be popular with the OIC. This is part of the reason the United Nations is kind of ridiculous in terms of a representative body. You have 57 countries representing the OIC. Many of those, of course, are not democracies. Uh, and each of those countries votes with exactly the same weight as, as Germany or Canada or Belgium. Um, and so you have a system whereby you have lots of countries with their own narrow parochial constituencies. Uh, and, you know, we could talk about Africa. And well, some, hold off yeah. on that. You've, you've yeah. got us on Middle East policy, yeah. so let's keep going there. Uh, Colm, uh, follow up on that if you would. We, I have uh, been told by numerous people in the Jewish community in this city that there is no more, and Paul Martin may have started it, but they say there's no more pro-Israeli government anywhere in the world than Stephen Harper's Canadian government. If that's the case, is that one of the reasons we lost? I think it, you know, it probably contributed. I mean, you know, you know, the, Israel is not terribly popular, but I think, you know, just to, to, to say that this is all about Israel, it's about a lot of different things. I mean, there, it's about um, Canada's history in the organization. I mean, if you go back 20 years, Canada was involved in every single UN peacekeeping operation on the globe. It now doesn't have a single combat unit or, uh, you know, battalion in any operation in the world. It has a number of police in Haiti. It has uh, military observers in quite a number of places. But, I mean, the grand sum of Can Can Canadian participation in peacekeeping missions is 200. So there are real policy issues. There's really th there are serious issues involving, you know, positions uh, that Canada has taken in terms of meeting its responsibilities in the UN that you need to sort of add into the mix. And I think that probably Israel played a role, but there were other issues, questions of how do you balance your Israel policy in terms of dealing with the Palestinians. Um, the Israelis cut off funding for UNRWA, which uh, is the main UN program that provides assistance to Palestinian refugees, and that probably didn't go uh, over very well with the OIC and with others in the Arab community. So uh, there are quite a number of issues that have to do with also uh, Canada's uh, relationship with African countries. Okay, it's again, hold off on that because I want to. I want to. I want to give Paul Heinbecker a chance to speak to the Middle East angle. I'm. I'm I'm focusing on that at the moment. Paul Heinbecker, the pro-Israeli, um, again, in the opinion of many in the Jewish community here, the overwhelmingly pro-Israeli position of the Harper government, what percentage do you think did that f uh, aspect of the Canadian government factor into the ultimate decision? I, I think it was pretty significant. I don't know if I could give you a number, uh, but there's no question in my mind that, uh, that it was probably decisive. Uh, by the way, uh, it's not just that it's all about Israel. It's all about Israel and Palestine. I think that's what the issue is. The Germans have a good relationship with the Israelis. The Germans uh, have a principled foreign policy. But the Germans got to manage to get elected. Part of the reason they got elected is, as Colum was saying, uh, that they, did, they, they carried out a more, uh, you know, not more balanced in the sense of even-handed, but, uh, you know, they did increase uh, significantly aid to, uh, to the Palestinian uh, sort of territories. Uh, they did call for, the uh, German ministers did call for an end to the blockade when the blockade was clearly a, 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 an element of collective punishment of, of, the, of the people in Gaza because of the government they elected. So there is, uh, there's a, there is a significant uh, factor there, and the people have looked at Canadian policy. The OIC is, is certainly interested in this issue, but they're not the only ones. They've looked at Canadian policy and they've concluded that it's, not, that it's unfair. We used to have uh, Canadian governments, successive Canadian governments, and I know because I was in them, all the way back to, uh, to Trudeau and, and Pearson, uh, uh, have supported uh, Israel's right to exist and indeed have supported Israel in every respect. But they also carried out what they considered to be a fair policy. 
this government has gone over to a side where it is scarcely critical. I can't remember when it made a critical statement about the settlement building. I, can't, I don't remember any criticism of Netanyahu's turning down of the continuation of the moratorium. I don't remember any criticism of decisions about the, about the barrier wall and where it was going. Okay, let me go to the guy uh, beside you and now. So on. Let me go to the guy beside you on a different uh, potential explanation for why we lost the vote. A couple of years ago, Jeff, uh, we did a program on your book, which very much focused on the environmental challenges, the climate change challenges that we're facing right now. Uh, again, the Harper government's reputation around the world as not being a particular champion of uh, addressing the climate change issues. Can I put it like that? How much of a factor do you think that was in the vote? Steve, I appreciate you mentioning that instant rare book. I really do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Look, there are, there are a range of factors. I think the Middle East question is more important. I, I've been briefed on this by ambassadors from, non, from countries other than Canada, and they include climate change in the mix. Now, the area of the world where this, uh, the shoe really pinched on this is you have a lot of small island states. They don't have very many people, but they have a vote. And uh, maybe they shouldn't have one, but that's the way the General Assembly of the United Nations works. So for these island states that literally face very serious environmental challenges up to the point of perhaps disappearing in the next 50 or 75 years, they want members on the Security Council that are committed to trying to do something about climate change. And unfortunately, Canada is widely seen around the world as being quite negligent in this regard because our record which stretches back to previous liberal governments, I might add, <coughs> has been very poor on this issue. In Europe, the climate change issue is important, as you know, and so insofar as our ability to get votes out of Europe, and Europe doesn't vote as a block, it has a tendency to support itself, but it doesn't vote as a block, that clearly set us back. So yes, it was among the issues, although I don't think it was as consequential as the Israeli question. Uh, John, are you, uh, let me pick up on something that I asked Jeffrey a little while ago. Are you offended at what might seem an unseemly way of trading votes? You give me my judge and I'll give you a seat on the council, or you vote for this for me. You know, we sort of see that as being all part of the give and take of making a bill law in a, you know, American-style democracy. Maybe we hold out higher aspirations for the United Nations. Does this bother you? Of course it's, it's bothersome. It's, um, look. If you read the United Nations Declaration, if you read the United Nations Charter, if you read all its grandiose mission statements, this is an organization which is devoted to um, you know, the highest human ideals. Um, and yet, when it comes to actually implementing them, the voting is done on a very crass basis. And I wouldn't mind if it were done as between democracies, uh, you know, help with various projects and peacemaking in Afghanistan and, and so forth. But often it comes down to things like, how are you going to vote? for a Human Rights Council um, attack on Israel, or for instance, dealing with China in terms of policy toward Taiwan. You know, people talk a lot about Israel, but it's not just Israel that isn't fairly represented at uh, the United Nations, it's also Taiwan. Uh, Israel and Taiwan, of course, aren't even eligible for Security Council representation. Hmm. Um, and so it's not just the fact that deals are being made, it's that deals are being made uh, with people operating in bad faith and, um, and the substance of the deals is not something I approve of. You could put a good gloss on it and say, well, you know, Germany is even-handed and they're fair, but ultimately you are talking about changing your policy in regard to things like the Middle East situation on the basis of can we get our man or woman onto the Security Council? And yes, I find that uh, to be an issue. Paul Heinbecker, let me try uh, this. In a, uh, oh, sorry, you want to follow? Can, may, I, may I respond to that? Sure, please. Uh, the, the idea that, uh, that, we, that there's no trading going on in democracies, I think, is... is, uh, is is being pretty precious. But that's not what Who's, I said. Who said that? That's not what I said. Well, it, it's it's sort of what you imply. No, that it's this not. organization ought to be, ought <clears throat> to be have a, have a higher standard. That's not what I said. And and there is a notion, by the way, and this is what I find uh, difficult as well. The idea that we're the ones who have the principles, and nobody else does. We're the sort of we've been appointed world's mother-in-law. And I think we have to really start to, to think about that because, uh, you know, the world didn't actually think that it agreed with us this time. Uh, we, 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 some of the umbrage we're taking is because we're principled and others are not. I think we lost to two other countries who would not, take, who would not accept the argument that we were more principled can, than they can were. I, can I just brief, brief, briefly respond to that? Uh, that, to me, seems an argument for relativism, saying, what do we know? Morality shall be judged on the basis of a United Nations vote. And I say, no, that's wrong. 
we judge what is moral and what's right. At all. Well, actually, you said that <laughs> the world judged that we're wrong, and therefore we have to take that judgment. No, they judge that my mind. Wait, wait, wait. So my mind. One second. Let's let him finish. Then we'll let you back in. You judge what your foreign policy is. You judge what your foreign policy is based on what's right. And if you know Saudi Arabia and Pakistan and Gabon say, well, we take a different view, you say, that's fine. That's the nature of this body where everyone gets one vote. But you don't resort to relativism and say, well, we must be wrong because an arithmetic count of all the nations of the world, including a few dozen Western democracies, but all, also all these other nations, if, according to their judgment, we're wrong. To me, that, that's morally meaningless. OK, Paul, your turn. Well, I, the point I was trying to get at is this. Um, we're not appointed. Uh, we, we present ourselves as principled. And our foreign policy is principled. And it's law abiding. It's about the advancement of international law. All right? Then what about international humanitarian law? What about international law insofar as the occupied territories are concerned? The, occupied, the territories have been occupied for 43 years. Next year, it will be as long as the Soviet Union occupied East Germany. When we support that kind of policy, people don't think that's principled. That may be how we perceive it, but that isn't how it's perceived in the world. We're perceived as not supporting international law. And the international law goes to the heart of the UN. It's, it's the, the UN Charter is the centerpiece. It's the rule book. And it's the, it's the closest thing there is to an, an international constitution. And everybody accepts that charter. That is a very dangerous thing to say. The idea of an international constitution superseding the morality as our government sees it and our national sovereignty, to me that is a very dangerous thing to say, Paul. And to me that goes to the heart of what we're discussing here, which is what is more important, Canadian values, which is the position I would take, or the idea that some confederation of nations, some of them democratic, some of them not, get to decide what our policy should be, and that seems to be what Paul is saying. Let Jeff Simpson in. I heard Jeff well, trying to I'm get in. saying that. Well, I think there are a range of reasons why we finished a humiliating third. I say humiliating only because the government can't have it both ways. They can't launch a campaign, stay at the campaign for several years, and then when we finish third, say, oh, well, it didn't matter much, or blame Mr. Ignatieff, which, frankly, is completely ludicrous. For example, and as I say, I've talked to ambassadors from other states about this. When the Prime Minister last year went to the General Assembly where there were leaders and flew back to attend a photo op at a Tim Hortons, that was noted by the ambassadorial community in Ottawa and reported to their governments. I don't know if that's principle or not, but that's what happened. The Southeast Asian countries, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, uh, Singapore, these countries all said, Canada doesn't pay the slightest bit of attention to us. They've given us none of their uh, attention over the last few years. In Africa, we suffered a tremendous erosion of support. Why? Because there was a general view, rightly or wrongly, that this government was not as concerned with Africa as previous governments, including the previous progressive conservative government of Brian Mulroney. Latin America was supposed to be our new emphasis with this government. We didn't do as well in Latin America as we thought, partly because Portuguese is an Iberian country. Brazil was working very hard for them. I'm told the other only part of the world where our support that we had had before held firm was in the Caribbean. So when you're suffering losses across not just Islamic states, but in Southeast Asia, we poked China in the eye. Turkey, we took a one-sided view on the Armenian question. All throughout Africa, didn't do as well in, Centr in Central and Latin America. You've got a wide range of reasons why this government put us in a position why we finished third. And it wasn't just wheeling and dealing. Other countries did that, as I said. It wasn't because they wheeled and dealed better. It wasn't one issue, although some were more important than others. There was a, an across-the-board view on a variety, for a variety of reasons that this government and Canada under this government was not as interested in the United Nations and not as interested as the issues such as aid and the Middle East and climate change and peacekeeping as previous governments of Canada had been going back to the foundation of the organization. Okay, Colm Lynch. And if I, hang on one second. Okay, hang on, I've got to get Colm in here. Okay, Colm, okay. because okay. I'm a Canadian and because I play hockey and because I eat donuts, I want to follow up on the Tim Hortons angle here that right. Jeffrey Simpson just referred to. <clears throat> that, that, um, that was a big deal up here. Uh, that, that was a really, uh, I think I can say this, that was a very successful photo op that the Prime Minister and his Finance Minister did at a donut shop in uh, suburban Toronto uh, instead of going to the United Nations. So in terms of domestic politics, it worked extremely well for them.
But I do want to follow up on Jeffrey Simpson's suggestion that people took notice down at the UN that the PM snubbed them that day. Did they take notice? Well, I, I suspect they did. I mean, I didn't even cover the story that day because we're just like Canada. We're all focused on the United States and we care about what the Americans do. But, you know, that's a small little detail that sort of adds up to a broader picture that Canada is not making the UN a central priority. Uh, but there are other issues like the decision not to lead a peacekeeping mission in Congo last year, and that's much more substantive, and that resonates throughout the whole uh, building. And if you talk to sort of, you know, people who are experienced old hands in UN peacekeeping, um, they take umbrage of that sort of thing. I mean, there was also uh, in the question of wheeling and dealing, uh, the Canadians apparently abstained on a vote that was very important to the EU recently, which would have allowed the EU as a bloc to speak before the UN General Assembly. And I think Canada, along with Australia and New Zealand, um, abstained on that vote, and that was remembered by the Europeans as well. So, you know, the, the, there are a million little pieces that go into sort of, you know, these final decisions. Sometimes they might have to do with, you know, some, you know, exchange of money. So a lot of times they have to do with, you know, how a country positions themselves in the world. So I don't think you can, you know, I, I agree that, um, say, the, the issue of the Middle East policy, that that may have been decisive. but. It wasn't the only issue. There were a lot of issues um, that, that I think countries probably took into account. Well, Paul Heimbecker, let me get you in here then and, yeah. and tell us what the, yeah. what are the real consequences? I know everybody was upset about the fact that we lost, but what are the actual consequences for the fact that we don't have this seat on the Security Council? Well, there are tangibles and, and intangibles. An intangible is that our reputation has taken a hit. Uh, we were regarded previously as a country that was that could could count on being on the Security Council when it wanted to be on the Security Council. We weren't greedy, uh, but we had our turn, and and uh, and people expected that. So now we're in a situation where where it's not so clear anymore that the world uh, is ready to support us. The second thing, and this is what I find troubling at the, at the moment, we're we're in a situation where a good part of the G20 membership is also going to be on the Security Council at the same time. And this is an opportunity for reforming the Security Council because there are, it does need to be sort of brought up to date in some way uh, to reflect current power realities. Uh, and these power, they, these changes that might be made, some of them could be very much in Canada's interest, some of them could be very much not in Canada's interest. Uh, and if we were on the, on the Council, we would have been able to uh, defend our interests. When we're not on the council, we have to hope that somebody else will take those interests into account. And the same thing goes for some of the big issues. We, you know, a, a, a major part of our foreign policy, a major focus of our foreign policy, of course, is Afghanistan. In the coming months, the, Afghanistan is going to be on the agenda. We've made an enormous investment there. We're going to try to be uh, sort of negotiating our way out of there. Another issue is Iran. Iran is on the agenda, and that's going to be coming to a head, and that's a very important issue. And again, here's an, here's, a, here's an opportunity for us to be promoting our interests when, in fact, uh, we're not going to, this time, we're not going to be there. And there's, the final thing I'd say is there's a kind of civic duty. If you, if, you, if you think that the UN needs to work better, and there aren't many of us who don't think it needs to work better, uh, there are some of us who think it uh, is working better than people appreciate, but nonetheless, the way to do that is to get involved it's, and to try to, and, and to work on it. It isn't to take your marbles and, and to walk away. And what we're, the situation we're in now is, uh, you know, we're not able to affect any of those things, except in, in the most difficult way from the outside. And by the way, it's not just the UN where we've been rejected. The Trans-Pacific uh, Trade Forum has just told us also that we're not welcome. And the, and the Latin Americans have created their own their new Latin American organization. Okay, I'll and, hold off on those because I want to get there. I want to get John Kay on the checklist. I mean, that's a pretty exhaustive checklist. There, everything from our reputation to reforming the Security Council, Afghanistan, Iran, civic duty. Um, uh, you know, do, do you th do you agree with that checklist in the sense that there have been consequences to our losing out here? Well, look. First, first of all, I think it's important to remember that just because you're not a member of the UN Security Council doesn't mean they will not hear your voice. Security Council can hear from countries that aren't currently in membership if the matter concerns that particular country. It ought to be there, though, right? Well, it happens all the time. But look, there's 192 countries at the United Nations. 187 of them don't have permanent seat. Those 187 countries are vying for 10, 10 seats. So most countries only get, on average, it's once every 20 years. It is not the end of the world when you're not on the UN Security Council. But we don't think of ourselves as most countries. It's true, I and that's, that's part of the problem. The problem is there's this sort of 
acronym obsession in Canada, that we are a fairly small country. We are obsessed with our stake in multilateral institutions because we realize that this is our primary source of status in the world. And I don't think that's a very healthy way to look at the Canadian contribution. I mean, if you look, and Paul, I'm talking about your book here since we talked about Jeff's book. Uh, Paul wrote this book, Getting Back in the Game, and it's a very worthy book. Uh, but the entire focus of the book is the idea, to my mind, <laughs> that we should somehow be part of the global game for the sake of being part of the global game. That this is part of Canada's national project to get people to listen to Canada. In this respect, I'm actually sympathetic to Brazil, which reportedly campaigned against Canada's inclusion uh, in the Security Council this time around, on the basis that our interests are largely aligned with the Americans, and the Americans are already on the Security Council per permanently. So to a certain extent, I'm actually sympathetic with the idea that if we feel like the Americans with global warming and with Israel, as this government does, it is broadly true that the world doesn't necessarily need a Canadian voice saying, we're here waving the flag, notice us, we're Canadian. Oh, and by the way, we share the same values of other Western democracies, such as the United States. Jeff Simpson, I thought Bono said the world needs more Canada. Apparently that's not the case. That's what Chapter's bookstore said. I said they needed more of my books, but they didn't listen. Um, <laughs> they need more of my book now, and thank you very much for mentioning it. I would, I would come at the question, and Jonathan just alluded to it this way. When you're a country of 34 million people, uh, and you have to try to advance your interests and protect your values as best you can, you have to do it multilaterally. You can have bilateral institutions or trilateral ones, as we have in North America with NAFTA, you can sign bilateral treaties with certain countries. But multilateralism, if I can put it that way, and I don't mean it in a religious sense, is important for modest-sized states like Canada for reasons of interests and values. Therefore, the United Nations, under both parties, has always been considered one of those international institutions, there are many others, that are important for a middle-sized country. Within those organizations, it isn't just a matter of status and waving flags although that might be a temptation for certain politicians, it really is a sense of what are our interests in the world and what are our values and how do we see the world evolving. So we participate. We've been accused of being excessive in our desire to participate in any organization that will have us. And if we don't have one, we'll create one. But nonetheless, the UN is one of those. And it has all the member states of the world there. And it does a lot of work outside the glare of New York whether it's UNESCO or whether it's the word fooled organization or whatever. <laughs> so it's in that sense that being active at the UN is part of a coherent foreign policy that says we want to be active for the reasons of our interests and values. We're not going to get our way all the time with as many multilateral institutions as we can. And when we are rebuffed within one of these organizations as badly as we have been in this instance, I think rather than being in denial, I think we should reflect upon what signal the world is sending to us because it's against our interests and our values when multilateral institutions are inclined to rebuff us. Well, let us uh, bask in the uh, aforementioned glow of New York and go down to uh, Colm Lynch. And Colm, you're the one non-Canadian of our group today, so I really uh, am interested in your opinion on this. Uh, given all of what we've talked about here tonight, how is Canada perceived internationally by those, and I know this is going to sound kind of smug, but by those whose opinions matter. And by that I mean, you know, United States, European Union, China, India, you know, that's the, that's the checklist. How are we perceived? Um, I think, I mean, certainly by the United States, I mean, ideologically, uh, the Harper government is maybe not that close to uh, the Obama administration, but I think that they think of uh, Canada as a serious, reliable partner. Uh, we're in a military engagement in Afghanistan together. Uh, the Americans would like Canada to stay there even a bit longer than they've committed to. Um, so I think that that's important. I mean, you know, I think that Canada is taken seriously by, you know, most of the others. I mean, one of the, the, the points that I just wanted to make is one of the, the uh, members of the panel was talking about, you know, is it really useful for a country like Canada to be in the UN or to be in the, in the Security Council? And there are a lot of things that you can do um, at the UN, even if you're not on the council, I mean, Am Ambassador Heinbecker tried to advance a negotiation to try and uh, uh, prevent uh, the U.S. invasion into Iraq. It didn't ultimately succeed, but, you know, they made an effort. Um, 
you know, small countries like Canada are, you know, had played a, a very vital role in the creation of peacekeeping, and this is a big deal. I mean, there are 100,000, you know, peacekeepers around the world, the second largest expeditionary force outside of the United States. This is an important thing, and the Americans, I mean, in Canada, I think that this has uh, contributed to its reputation as a serious player, um, but people recognize that they have been withdrawing to a certain degree from that. Um, another issue is, uh, let's say, smart sanctions. I mean, the, uh, the kind of reaction to comprehensive sanctions in Iraq, uh, the large number of people who died from malnutrition as a result of, of economic sanctions on Iraq led to small countries agitating to try to change the focus, the nature of sanctions, so they focused on uh, individuals that are responsible for wrongdoing and they didn't harm other people. And Canada played a quite decisive role in Angola, um, more than uh, you know, back in the late 1990s um, period under Robert Fowler. So um, there are things that small countries can do if they have um, active, energetic people who can sort of play along the margins. That can have, you know, that can find kind of important opportunities for advancing their own interests or advancing particular, you know, pragmatic issues like, you know, sanctions, smart sanctions, and peacekeeping. Okay, so that's the there non, are areas where you can be useful. That's the non-Canadian's point of view. Let me get a Canadian's point of view now and go back to Paul Heinbecker in Ottawa. How do, how do you believe the countries or the jurisdictions in the world, quote unquote, that count or that have the biggest voice? How do you think they perceive us today? I think they perceive us pretty well, except uh, I'm, you know, I'm uh, like everybody else. I'm pretty dis disappointed with the outcome of the vote. Uh, when I was in New York, uh, and I'd like to come back to the Security Council for a second. When I was in New York, uh, I was struck by the the hearing I got. Uh, I always got a, uh, a good hearing. I got a good hearing as much for what we were domestically as what we were internationally. Internationally, we were perceived to be constructive. Uh, during the time I was in New York, we fought the blood diamonds issue, as Colin was referring to. We helped establish the International Criminal Court. We created something called the, uh, the Responsibility to pr Protect, which was an outcome of the, of the failures in Kosovo and Rwanda, and so on. Uh, but we were also considered to be a very significant country because of how we governed ourselves, that we were, the, that we were better able to integrate uh, foreigners into our society than practically anybody else on earth, and it's an important issue these days. And secondly, we were able to harness those, that diversity uh, to make ourselves uh, more effective. Uh, one of the things I'd say about the Security Council, whether it's, in, whether it's better to be on it or not on it, uh, I think that if, and, and no one will ever know the answer to this question, it was much more difficult for me to advance the idea of a compromise on Iraq from off of the council than it would have been if I had been on the council. Because mm. when you're in the room, you can make much more cogent arguments, and, you can, and, you can, and the arguments start to, to, to be dealt with on their merits rather than necessarily on where they're coming from. OK, I've got so about three minutes to go here. Difference from that. Uh, forgive me, Paul. We've got about three minutes to go here, and I want to put sure. one more thing on the table, and that is this. Uh, we've heard about a lot of the noble things the United Nations does and where it's involved in the world. We also know about an oil for food program related to Iraq that didn't turn out so well. We know about a sex trafficking scandal in Africa. We know about the usual claims of incompetence and overly secretive dealings and uh, fecklessness, I guess is one way to put it, in some of the UN's dealings around the world. So John, start us off on this. Does the path to an improved international reputation go through the United Nations? Look, I think there's absolutely no doubt that the United Nations does good work if you look beyond the theater of, uh, of New York and Geneva. Um, you know, the World Food Program, the World Health Organization, and that's something that touched what happened here in Canada with SARS. Uh, World Health Organization has been a great body for, for saving countless lives by, uh, by helping uh, stop the spread of epidemics and that sort of thing. But this is done on a very local level. These are done by, by workers out in the field. And I think Canada can and, and does contribute a lot to that with expertise and, and, and with this money. Um, I am more skeptical that it is important that we have a prominent role in the in the political theater that goes on uh, at Turtle Bay. Jeff Simpson, what do you say? I say that uh, <clears throat> when your country has been involved in an organization as intimately as we have at the UN since its creation, and when you've established the importance of the organization to the country, and generally speaking, Canadians have been more supportive of the United Nations than, say, our American friends, notwithstanding the fact that the organization has critics here, and they're very vocal, 
and they're not without reason in some instances, and you finish third, <laughs> it wasn't close. You have to reflect upon why that happened. You have to reflect upon the fact that for a variety of reasons, countries were sending us signals that they are not happy with our positions on a variety of issues. Now, you may say these are principled positions. I don't think they're particularly principled on climate change, for example. Um, but it has been a severe setback, I say, to our foreign policy. The government having identified a successful end to the campaign as a foreign policy priority, when you finish third, I don't see how logically you can contend other than it is a setback for the government and through the government for the country. Colin Lynch, what I do you say on the issue? Well, on, on, on which issue? I mean, on the question of whether an improved about the international of, reputation goes through the UN. Um, well, actually, I'm, I'm more interested in the first question about the, 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 what you were talking about, the fecklessness of the UN and all of these scandals. Um, we are literally down to our last minute, so okay. take it if you like. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll take a pass on it. No, no, I'm saying, you, I'm happy to have you make your point, but oh. I've only got 60 seconds left. Oh, okay. Just that this is one area where I think they have a big, big problem in terms of sort of managing um, the peacekeeping missions and the broader ability to sort of prevent uh, fraud and misconduct and to sort of administer to the place. I think that there have been some real setbacks in the last couple of years that have kind of weakened their ability to police themselves. And I think that's going to be a big problem for them in the kind of years ahead. Paul Heinbecker, you got 45 seconds. Latin, the last word, I guess. Um, I think that the, what we, it was very significant that our support dropped so dramatically. Uh, we only got 113 or 114 votes the first round. That's already down significantly from where we've been in the past. But then on the second round, uh, when people were free from their commitments to us, these commitments that, which, that somebody called nefarious, mm -hmm. when they had acquitted their obligations to us, then our, then our votes plummeted. And that, I think, is a very sobering thing. Mm. I would have expected, uh, in, a, in a kind of free-for-all, that we would do better. This was the year of the G20, the G8, the Olympic Games. If there ever was a, a serendipitous time to be facing a UN Security Council election, this was the year. Okay, Paul, but I'm going to have to cut you off dramatically. there. I have to cut you off, or I won't have time to plug your book. So you decide. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> I'll tell you. Can we thank our friend Colm Lynch for joining us from New York City, from the Washington Post and Foreign Policy Magazine blog. Uh, Colm, first time on the program. It's nice to meet you. Nice to have you on the program. Thanks for All participating. Right, thanks for having me. And in our Ottawa Bureau, Jeffrey Simpson, Globe and Mail's National Affairs columnist, and yes, Paul Heinbecker, our former ambassador at the United Nations and the author most recently of Getting Back in the Game, a Foreign Policy Playbook for Canada. Recommended reading for anybody who wants to know more about this topic. Uh, thanks to you two gentlemen in our nation's capital. Appreciate your Thank time you. today. And Jonathan Kay from the National Post, just down the street. We're glad to have you with, with us tonight as well, Jeff. Th um, John, excuse me. Thanks so much.